Hey friends, it's Ben again. This is yet another video for the differential calculus class. This time, what we're looking at is the chain rule. <clears throat> so the essential notion with the chain rule is just that you have a function contained inside of a function. So for example, if you have the square root of 2x plus 1, clearly 2x plus 1 is a function and square root is a different function. Uh, but then you, you have crafted a third function out of putting one inside of the other. So <clears throat> we've actually done a few problems, I think like back with, um, uh, with the definition stuff. I did something like the square root of two X plus one as an example. And you ended up as things worked out getting this mysterious two or maybe it was a three X, I don't know. You get, get this mysterious extra factor that just kind of popped up as you went along because of, of how, um, how the algebra worked. But now we're gonna have a reason why that crops up and maybe an easier way to actually get at it. Okay. Biggest thing to, to think about with it is the pieces of the function that are inside and the pieces of function that are outside. So let's take a quick look here. And so your chain rule says that if you got f of g of x, <clears throat> then the derivative of that, that composition function there will be f prime, but then evaluated at g of x. So you'll stick the stuff that was inside the function back inside a derivative, and then multiply by g prime of x. So if you think about our square root of, what was it, 3x plus 1? You know that the square root of x, the derivative for it is going to be one half of one of the square root. And then the derivative of that uh, 2x plus 1 or whatever it was will just be the constant. So here's one that is a little bit more complicated than that, but not too much. So we talk about the square root of x squared plus one. So the stuff on the inside is going to be your g of x. And the outside is going to be that square root. And that's going to be your f of x. So when we have to take the derivative of that, we'll think about our square root is the one half power. And we know that taking the derivative of that would just give us one half x to the minus one half. Okay, but then we have to plug the inside back in. So our f prime of g of x, we would have one half of the x squared plus one to the minus one half power. And please remember, you cannot distribute that square root across there. If you could, I would, because it would make things so much easier. So uh, a big deal that you all will have to pick out is what is the outside function and what is the inside function, okay? So with regard to this, you'd have this one half of the quantity x squared plus one to the minus one half, and then times a two x from the derivative of x squared plus one. And then once you've got that, uh, we would go ahead and say, hey, this one half and this two will cancel out, we'll end up with just x divided by this square root from the minus one half power, okay? All right, so let's look through actually using this to do some problems. And so the first thing we'll do is to have a sine cubed plus cosine two x, and we're gonna ask what the tangent line is there at zero one. So, so we will have to find f prime of x and we're going to come along here and say something about the derivative of sine cubed being our first piece. So sine cubed, will I'll step off to the side and say, well, that is 
sine x and then cubed. And once you see that, you can see that the outside function is the cubing. And the inside function is the sine. Okay. So if I just had x cubed and asked you to take the derivative of it, you would say three times x squared. But we're not putting x in, we're putting sine x in. Okay. And then outside of that, you would take you would give the derivative of the thing that's inside, the derivative of the sine is cosine. So then you'd have that plus now we have to do the derivative of cosine of 2x. Now the cosine of 2x, this time the outside part is going to be the cosine and the inside part is just this 2x. So if somebody asks you to take the derivative of cosine, you would say it is a minus sine but you would put the 2x back in and then you'd multiply by the derivative of that 2x, which is just two. So simplifying this, you would say three times sine squared x cosine x minus two times the sine of 2x, okay? Now, if you had to actually do anything with this, like set it equal to zero, you would also want to use your trig identities to make that sine 2x into 2 sine x cosine x. That is not necessary for what is asked here, but um, for something where you needed to set it equal to something and solve, you would probably want to do that. For our purposes though, haha, <laughs> got to change back we need to find f prime at zero, three times sine of zero is zero, cosine of zero is one, minus two times the sine of zero, so that's gonna be zero, right? So we ended up getting a zero for a slope here. Well, that was not very interesting. Sorry about that. So then we'd say y minus, the point is one zero, so y minus one equals zero times x minus zero. So if you solve for it, y equals one is your tangent line. So, right? <clears throat> then the next one is asking us to take that a step farther and find where the function is increasing and decreasing. So we're gonna to have to take the derivative and set it equal to zero. And so this may involve things getting a little bit ickier, okay? So the e to the cosine x, the cosine is the inside part. So the e to the something is the outside part. So we should all remember that e to the x, the derivative is just e to the x. It just doesn't change it. So if, you, you, if you're asked to take the derivative of e to the something, you write e to that something. And then the chain rule says you have to put it times the derivative of the something inside. So the derivative of cosine is minus sine, okay? And so this has turned into minus sine x e to the cosine x. I am purposely going to block that off for a reason there. Because when we set this equal to zero, exponentials can never be zero. In fact, they can never be negative. So we actually could kind of shortcut this by noting where sine x is zero is going to be all the multiples of pi for um, you know, any, pause, any integer multiple of pi. So zero, one, two are the things that we're really interested in here, okay? But we could also simply say that the places that it's increasing and decreasing are exactly where sine is, uh, 
is positive or negative. Well, the opposite, negative or positive. So, but for our purposes, we're going to think about our number line here because we are talking about this, uh, a periodic function, e to the cosine x. The cosine is periodic, so it'll make it periodic. We're only going to worry about 0 to 2 pi. And uh, the 0 pi and 2 pi being the cutoff points there, good places to test would be at pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. And so then you'll have to think about g prime of pi over 2 is going to be minus the sine of pi over 2 is 1. And then e to the cosine of pi over 2, the cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So you got a negative 1 there. And then your g prime, I wrote that at a weird spot, sorry. g prime at 3 pi over 2 is negative. Now the sine of 3 pi over 2 is going to be negative 1 and e to the cosine of 3 pi over 2, cosine of 3 pi over 2 is 0. So we end up with a positive 1. So um, if we're just lining these up here, the decreasing stuff that we got there around pi over 2, that, that would mean that we're thinking about this interval here. So the um, decreasing is going to be from 0 to pi. And increasing is going to be where the derivative is positive. So stuff there around 3 pi over 2. So from pi to 2 pi. Most of these problems, we end up getting unions of, uh, of intervals and stuff. But this particular one, it just happened to, to break at a nice place. All right, here's another one. We're finding the intervals where h of x equals e to the minus x squared is concave up or concave down. Uh, e to the minus x squared is a function which is tied to the normal distribution. The normal distribution is hugely important in probability and statistics. And probability and statistics are hugely important to science. So <laughs> it's uh, handy to know about where these things crop up at. So h prime of x, we're going to have to say derivative of e to the something is e to that same thing. Notice this, the piece in the exponent did not change. But then the chain rule says we have to multiply by the derivative of that thing. So you might simplify it as minus 2x e to the minus x squared. Okay. Now, once you've got that, we're going to find h double prime of x. And this, of course, makes things into a little bit of a pain because we have a product rule. And the second factor in the product rule then involves a chain rule. So, all right, I will leave the minus two just hanging out to the front and only concentrate on the things that have variables in them. So the derivative of x is one, and we leave the e to the minus x squared alone, plus x times, now we take the derivative of e to the minus x squared, which we have already done, so we can just write down the same answer, e to the minus x squared times minus 2x, OK? So we have this equal to minus 2 times e to the minus x squared minus 2x squared e to the minus x squared. And then you'll spot we have minus 2, and then an e to the minus x squared will factor out the whole thing. And we have 1 minus 2x squared. 
So when we set that equal to zero, you know that um, negative two can never be zero and an exponential can never be zero. So it has to be this part here that made it zero. So if one minus two x squared is zero, then two x squared is one, x squared is one half. And I need y'all, so some folks have had problems remembering this. That means that x squared is gonna have to be either plus or minus this square root of one half. I like to write it as one over the square root of two. If you like to write the whole thing into the square root, you know, same thing, okay? Now for my number line here, I'm gonna set this out like so. And the points that I have to break around are negative one over the square root of two and positive one over the square root of two. And though, you know, one over the square root of two is like 0.7, something like that, right? You don't really need a very exact value for it because you're sampling, you get to sample zero and negative one and positive one, okay? So H double prime of negative one, uh, we're gonna uh, plug back into the function there, have minus two e to the minus one, and then one minus two. So we end up with two over e, and that is positive. As a matter of fact, if you paid attention to how that was done, we had squares everywhere the x appeared, we can actually get this done faster and say plus or minus one, that you're gonna get the positives on both of those. And that tells you that you have something that is increasing you know, on both ends there. You, if you're guessing that it's gonna be decreasing in the middle, you are totally right, but you have to show it. So H double prime at zero, we will have minus two e to the zero and one minus two times zero. So we end up getting negative two, which is last time I checked, negative. And, um, and my page has gotten super cluttered up here. So I am gonna move things around a little bit so that uh, we can spot the answer a little bit easier. Yeah. All right, so increasing. Oh, and I did it again. I said the words in the word increasing when I meant concave up and then concave down. Okay. The place where it was concave down, remember, is the middle part. So that's from minus one over root two to plus one over root two. And then concave up is everything outside that. So minus infinity to minus one over root two, union one over root two to plus infinity, okay? Sometimes I write the plus in front of the infinity, sometimes I don't, it doesn't really make a difference there. Alrighty, <clears throat> that gets that figured out, okay? And like I say, this, um, this function that we're, that we're referring to here is uh, related to the uh, normal distributions. Normal distributions have graphs that look something like this. It's not a super duper drawing of it, but these places where the concavity changes at are actually gonna be places on the graph where you, um, where you can identify where the standard deviation is. If you're hearing all that and going, I don't know what any of that is, please stop talking, it's all scary. Yeah, it's something from statistics and it's actually pretty easy to deal with. It's just different stuff we haven't studied. All right, so this problem here asks us to show that the, 
the function we have is a solution to the equation, right? And these sorts of problems showing that you have a solution to a differential equation are meant to be easy problems because it gives you an answer and just asks you to show that it is the correct answer. So all you have to do for this is to calculate this stuff that's on the left-hand side and show that it turns out to be the right-hand side. So for us, we're going to have to calculate S double prime. I know it's maybe a little confusing that I refer to the function S and then the equation Y. Um, what's going on there is that you have to be thinking of plugging the S in for the Y, much like you plug in things with the chain rule. So, so we're going to do S double prime. I lied. We'll do S prime of X to start with. And of course, a e to the x, the derivative of that is just e to the x, plus b e to the minus x, the derivative of an e to the anything is e to the anything, but then times a minus 1, because that's the derivative of the e to the x. Yeah, I'm sorry, that's the derivative of the minus x. So, so if you want to simplify that, you've got a e to the x minus b e to the minus x. Then the s double prime of x, we'll go through and do it again. a times the derivative e to the x is just e to the x, minus b times derivative e to the minus x is e to the minus x, but minus 1. So when we simplify here, we get a e to the x yeah, uh, plus b e to the minus x. So s double prime minus s would be a e to the x plus b e to the minus x minus a e to the x plus b e to the minus x. And these are the same being subtracted. These are the same being subtracted. Therefore, this is going to be equal to zero. Yay! <clears throat> All right. And that, believe it or uh, Oh, no. I, hmm, ha -ha. I, had, I had left for myself a little mark here in the corner to tell me that this was the last one, but maybe I have a couple more. Nope. Yeah, just get just get one more. Um, I wanted to make sure and do one like this because I was afraid that y'all might think I was punking out too much by not doing something uh, where you had products and so forth all at once. So we're going to find the second derivative of this thing here with the secant x and the tangent x together. Okay, so. To get there, we're going to have to start out with p prime, and we have a product. So we'll have to take the derivative of the first one. Let's see, secant of 2x. So the derivative of secant is secant tangent, and I'll leave the tan 3x hanging on there. And yeah. Actually, I should scoot it a little ways down. OK, so the secant tangent, and then you have to plug in the thing that was inside it already, but it appears in two places. Just like if you had like an x squared plus 2x, the x appears in two places. You have to be talking about the x in every place, not just one place. All right, then times. The chain rule says to put a 2 in there, because that's the derivative of the 2x. Plus, now this time we will leave the secant 2x alone and take the derivative of the tangent, which is secant, eh, secant squared of the 3x. And then the chain rule says multiply that by 3. So this ends up being um, 2 times secant 2x tangent 2x tangent 3x 
plus secant 2x. Oh, I missed my three. Hang on. 3x. All right. So now when we're asked to do the second derivative here, it's going to be a bit of a pain because as we're going along doing it, we're going to have to deal with three factors in our derivative. We did an example like that in the last one. But in the other piece, we'll have to use a product rule. And in the middle of using the product rule, we'll have to use a chain rule one way on this one. And then we'll have to use it two ways on that one. So well, bear with me. We'll get it done. All right. So p double prime of x equals just tackle it one piece at a time, two times. All right. So uh, we go through and just do one factor at a time. The derivative of a secant is a secant tangent. So secant tangent, and then we'll have more stuff to do. But we need to have a 2x in there on each of those. And the chain rule says that we won't get a 2x at the end, but a 2. All right. And then I will have to pause. I will have to pause because I have a phone call. Apologies for that. Uh, the caller ID said it was my children's school, so I thought it might be important. I was wrong. So, all right. Um, so let me share screen again here and put this back on screen. All right. So I went ahead and added in the tan 2x and tan 3x, which we're not doing anything with. Okay. And then we'll say plus, and now we'll have the secant of 2x that's not having anything done with it because we've finished that little part. Now we're going to do the derivative of the tangent of 2x, and that is going to be secant squared of 2x, and the chain rule says to put a 2 at the end, and then we'll put our tangent 3x in there, which is not having anything done to it. So now we're done with that piece. And then we've got plus a secant of 2x that we're leaving alone, a tangent of 2x that we're leaving alone, and now a derivative of the tangent 3x, which is secant squared 3x times 3. All that is getting multiplied by 2. All right, I have got to reposition some of this because it is not all going to fit onto the screen if I don't. So bear with me a little bit here. And if you're looking at it and saying, oh gosh, that's uh, getting kind of kind of packed up in there. Yeah, sorry. Okay, now that we've got those bits taken care of, we need to worry about this here, okay? And so we will for it say uh, plus three times, okay? <clears throat> and now we'll take the derivative of secant, which is secant tangent, and then a 2x goes in there, and then we have to chain rule it and put a 2 at the end. Then after that, the secant squared 3x, <clears throat> we have to go ahead and leave um, leave alone, but now we're taking the derivative of it. Then plus 
Now we have to take the derivative of the secant squared of 3x. It's a little, little cumbersome because the outermost function there, the thing that was done is done last if you were calculating, would be the squaring. So we will have two times the secant with the 3x in it times now the next level in was the secant. So we have to have the secant derivative, which is secant tangent like that. And then the derivative of the secant, I'm sorry, the derivative of this part that was inside of the secant is just this three, okay? And now we're gonna try to see Ugh, what we can do on these to make them not quite so horrifying. So uh, I'm trying to, trying to tidy up here. I see that I've got a secant x on each one of these. I've got a tangent x on that secant squared and tangent here. So I don't have enough to trade. Oh, wait. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to make a mess here and then we'll try to we'll try to tidy it up afterward. Okay. So that very first term there, four times uh, secant two x tan squared two x tan three x plus four times secant cubed of 2x tan 3x plus 6 secant 2x tan 2x secant squared 3x plus uh, 6 secant 2x tan 2x secant squared 3x uh, plus, I started to say 6, but it looks like 12 secant squared 3x tan, nope, sorry. There is a copying error from above that I just caught. That was supposed to be a secant of 2x. So this piece here does not simplify like I thought. So 12 secant 2x secant 3x tangent 3x. Ugh, horrible looking. Uh, you can see a secant 2x comes out of the whole thing, but I don't know that that will make things all that much better. Yeah. Yep, I think maybe this one just gets written off. And the important lesson that we actually get out of it is that when you have secants and tangents together and you have to take several derivatives, it gets very, very messy, especially if you have have to do something with the chain rule at the same time. So, all right. <clears throat> so, um, that should get us for now. I will see you all in class.